Welcome to Algorithms with Professor Caleb. Today I'd like to talk about the quicksort algorithm. Quicksort is named because it is a quick sort. It has very low overhead compared to things like heap sort, merge sort. However, the basic version doesn't always perform well, and its weaknesses are sorted and reverse data. In this video, I'd like to help you understand the basic quicksort algorithm and understand the weaknesses of that algorithm. Then in the next video, we'll look at how we go about improving that and writing the quicksort that we usually see in practice. So the basic concept of quicksort is that we're going to select a pivot and then we're going to swap items so that anything smaller than the pivot is to the left and anything bigger than the pivot will be to the right in the array. Then we're going to put the pivot into its proper place in the array and recursively quick sort the parts of the array to the left and right of the pivot. A key issue here is going to be picking the pivot. And that's what we'll be specifically looking at in the next video. For now, we're just going to pick the rightmost item. You will see versions of quicksort where people pick the leftmost item. Overall, this will work the same way. And as I said in the next video, we'll actually look at how to do this in a systematic way that will improve our performance on data that isn't quite as random. So here's the quicksort algorithm. Basic version. I have an array. I've got my index to the left and my index to the right. So in any given execution of this algorithm, we're trying to sort the items between the left and the right inclusive. If we have more than one item in the array, then we're going to actually do the quick sort. If there's only one item in that section of the array, then obviously it's already sorted. We've only got one item. So the first step that we're going to do is setting things up. So in doing that, we're first going to identify Here's our pivot, which, as we said, will take the rightmost item to be our pivot. Then we're going to set up a pair of counters. One of them we're going to put at left minus one, which we typically call I, and J we will put at right, so it's currently where the pivot is. So if we have this array, we'll start by identifying our pivot and setting up I at minus one in this case, because we're sorting everything from zero to 13, and J is at, has 13. <laughs> then we go into an infinite loop, which we will break out of, but it is convenient for us to get out of the loop at a different place from when we're going into it. And in that loop, the first thing we're going to do is to pre-increment I and check to see if the new location is smaller than the pivot. As long as it's still smaller than the pivot, we're gonna keep going. Then we're going to do the same kind of thing in the other direction with J. We start out, we increase I to zero, check it. Seven is smaller than 12, so we keep going. Eight is smaller than 12, so again, we keep going. 10 is smaller, two is smaller. Now, when I is four, 26 is not smaller than 12, so we stop that while loop and we move on to work on the J. So J goes to 12, 13 is bigger. Six, however, is not bigger than our pivot. So at this point, we have one item toward the left of our array that is bigger than our pivot, and one item toward the right of our array that is smaller than the pivot. So we're going to swap those. So this is our swap. We didn't break because I is not greater than or equal to J. This is when they cross and we want to get out of the loop. But right now we're not, we're continuing. So we just swap these two items. So we do that swap. And now we're going back up to the beginning of our outer loop here and back to walking through I. So we check at index five, four is smaller than 12. At 19, that is not smaller than 12. So we go over to our J. And immediately at index 10, hit the 11, which is not bigger than 12. So again, we're going to swap these two and go back to moving I along. So we go to 5, 3, 
16 is not smaller than the pivot. Now we switch to our J and stop when we get to index 8. The 3 is not bigger than the pivot. So this time we have crossed our I and J, so we're going to drop out of the loop. So when we drop out because of that break up there, basically we're swapping a sub I and the pivot. Once we've done that, the pivot will be in place. So we swap that 12 and 16, and now the 12 is in place. We have a left partition and a right partition. We typically will call this process of getting things swapped around and putting the pivot where it goes a partitioning of the array. We're dividing the array up into here's where the pivot goes, everything to the left of the pivot that was part of this process when we started is now in the left partition that we'll call quick sort on. Everything to the right of the pivot is now in the right partition and we'll call quick sort on that as well. We have the thing in place. We're going to call quick sort on left and I minus one because I is the location of the pivot now. And then quick sort with I plus one and right. So the next step is to set things up for the left partition. So we set up the pivot and the counters to go through and do this all again. This time our pivot is three. So I is going to stop at zero because the seven is not smaller than the three. So now we start work on J. Five is bigger, 11 is bigger, four is bigger, six is bigger. We get to the two, we need to swap. So we do that swap and then get to moving I again. It will stop, of course, when it gets to index one, it'd be eight. And then we move J along until it gets to index two. So at this point, again, the I and J have crossed. So we swap the eight and the three. And we now have the three in place with these new partitions. So when we see this, we see that the left partition has only one item in it. So when we call quick sort there, that will stop. So the next step will be to actually do the quick sort on two to eight. So we set that up. Pivot is at index eight and value eight. J is eight, I is one. And we start the process walking through with I. I is gonna stop at two. J will stop at index seven, and we'll swap those. Then I will move along and stop at index six. That's the next thing where it's not smaller than eight. And J will move along and stop at index five, where we have the four that is not larger than eight. Those have crossed. So we're gonna swap with pivot and put the eight in its place. So then the next step is to work with the partition from two to five. So we set up the pivot and counters for that. Once we move the I along, it's gonna stop when we get to the five there because five is bigger than four. J is going to go along all the way until it gets to index one. So that's the first thing that's not bigger than the pivot. So now we swap and the four is in place. So now we do the same sort of thing again with a pivot of five. So the I will stop at seven. The J will stop at the four at index two. And we'll swap the seven and the five. And that five is now in place. This can get a little tedious. One of the things we'll look at in the next video is how we avoid some of this with these very small partitions. So now our pivot is seven and index five. I will stop at that spot. That's the first thing that is not smaller than the pivot. J will stop at six and index four. We've crossed, so we swap the pivot, in this case with itself, actually, and that pivot is in place. And we see that the left side here has one item, the right hand side has zero items. So at this point, as we work out through our recursive call stack, we're going to find ourselves at indexes seven and eight. So we do the same kind of thing here. I will stop at the eight, J will stop at the seven, 
will do that swap of 11 with itself and it's in place. Of course, the left partition and right partitions are both already sorted since one has one item and the other has zero items. So now we are at this last line of our original call of quicksort. We're doing the quicksort on the rightmost partitioning partition for our initial partitioning when we put that 12 in place. So now the pivot is at index 13 with that value 16. We've set up i to be 9 and j to be 13. We're going to stop i at the 10. We're going to stop j at index 12. We swap that 13 and 19 and then we'll continue. i will stop again at 26. J will stop when it gets to index 10 on the 13. And at this point, they've crossed. So we're going to do the swap with the pivot. And that puts that pivot in place. The left partition just has the one item in it. So it's sorted. And so the last step will be the final partitioning with 26 as our pivot. I will stop here at 13. J will stop at 12. We'll swap the pivot with itself. That pivot is in place. The left side has only one item. The right side, of course, has zero items. And so we are done. And that is how basic quicksort works. Now let's talk just a little bit about the performance of quicksort. If our divisions are in half or close to that, each time we'll be dividing in half get down to the single items, we're going to find that that's big O of n log n. So that's going to be very similar to what happens with merge sort, for example, as long as we're dividing about in half. There's also very low overhead here. It's not like keep sort, where we've got to go do something with everything and then turn around and do all the blatant axes. This is much quicker in terms of constant factors compared to heap sort. And yet it still has a space cost of only n plus one. So merge sorts overhead is not that great, though the copy back for the recursive version can get a little painful. But merge sort, of course, requires two arrays in order to do efficient merging. Quick sort does not. Quick sort is just doing swaps. So its space cost is smaller but let's think about the performance of quicksort on pre-sorted data. So of course, that's our super fast option for things like improved bubble sort, insertion sort, where we're going to go through them in big O of n time. For merge sort, of course, it's the same for everything. For heap sort, it's the same. But we still do n log n performance on sorted or reverse data. But what happens with quicksort? Well, that first partitioning that we do is going to put the last item in place with n minus 1 comparisons. The second partitioning then will put the next to last item in place with n minus 2 comparisons. And the third puts the third to last item in place with n minus 3 comparisons. And this should be very familiar. If you've worked through the elementary sort approaches and why they're n squared, because it's n minus 1 plus n minus 2 plus n minus 3, et cetera, until we get down to plus 3 plus 2 plus 1. And that is n times n minus 1 over 2, which is big O of n squared. So on pre sorted data, quick sort looks like an elementary sort. It is actually n squared in the worst case which is not only pre-sorted data, but reverse data will also get the same performance. The bottom line, this is generally a low overhead, big O of n log n sort on random data. But it is big O of n squared in the worst case. And the key to fixing this is we need a better way to pick a pivot just picking the last item or just picking the first item isn't going to work well for us. So what we're going to look at in the next video is how to pick a pivot in a way
it's going to give us some better performance. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time as we talk about what we call median of three with quicksort.